Good morning, and thank you for joining us on this webinar that focuses on delivering equity-minded student services in the online environment. As most of you know, this is our second webinar in response to the crisis regarding COVID-19. And we are very grateful for the three organizations that have agreed to sponsor this webinar, those being the Chief Student Services Officers Association of California, ACPA College Student Educators International, and the Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement. And we're also incredibly grateful to all of you and for your tireless work in supporting students during this unprecedented pandemic. We've always said that student services work is both life changing and life sustaining. And the circumstances that we've had to deal with these past few weeks are clearly evident of this. I'm Dr. Frank Harris III and I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. J. Luke Wood, who serves as Chief Diversity Officer at San Diego State. Throughout this webinar, we invite you to post your thoughts and reflections online uh, on social media using the hashtag equity online. And in addition, at the conclusion of this workshop, we'll take a few minutes to respond to questions. You have two options for posting your questions. You can do it on Twitter using the hashtag equity online, or you can use the question and answer feature that's available here in the Zoom app. Now, please keep in mind that there's more than 4,500 of you that are registered for this webinar. So we're not gonna be able to address every single question, but we will do the best that we can to get through as many of them as possible. And in addition, please know that this webinar is being recorded and a fully captioned version of the recording will be shared sometime tomorrow. We have two objectives for this webinar. First, we'll spend some time discussing the barriers and pressures that impact the delivery and efficacy of student services online that have emerged as a result of COVID-19. More specifically, we will talk about what makes it difficult to serve students from an equity-minded and institutional responsibility perspective when all of our communications and interactions with them are limited to what we can do virtually. We'll also offer some strategies that have been proven effective in infusing equity-minded and cultural affirmation into virtual student services. Please keep two things as you participate in this webinar. Two things in mind. First, our work prioritizes racially minoritized students in community colleges, as these students tend to be the most disproportionately impacted students in post-secondary education. That said, we're sure you'll find that many of the insights that we share have implications for students at four-year institutions, as well as other disproportionately impacted students. Second, this is not a technical webinar. We focus specifically on equity-minded practices. So we encourage all of you to continue to find ways to build your capacity by learning about some of the technical resources and platforms that are available to deliver student services remotely. Platforms like Cranium Cafe and Well Connect, to name a couple. In preparing the content for today's webinar, we found it essential that we reach out to some of our colleagues who serve as Chief Student Services Officers and in community colleges. And in doing so, we sent several colleagues a brief questionnaire that asked them to identify three things. First, we asked them to talk about some of the pressures and challenges that students are experiencing and the ways in which COVID-19 has impacted disproportionately impacted students. We've also asked them to talk about challenges that they have experienced in keeping equity at the forefront of their operations and student services while having to remove them remotely and having to do so in an incredibly short amount of time. And lastly, we asked them to talk about some of the steps that they've undertaken to build capacity within their organizations and amongst their staff to meet the needs of students during this unprecedented time. We're fortunate to have had 10 colleagues who took the time to share their insights. These colleagues are Dr. Eric Bishop, who serves as Associate Superintendent of Student Services and Legislative Engagement at Chafee College in California. Herbert English Jr., who's the Vice President of Student Services at West Hills Kalinga College. Dr. Angelica Garcia, who was previously Vice President of Student Services at Skyline College and now serves as President of Berkeley City College in California. 
Dr. Shanti Hands, who serves as Vice President of Student Services at San Diego Mesa College. Dr. Tina King, who's the Assistant Superintendent and Vice President of Student Affairs at Southwestern College. Dr. Kim Lowry, who is the Vice President of Student Services and Instruction at Lone Star College Houston North in Texas. Dr. Cynthia Olivo, who's Vice President of Student Services at Pasadena City College in California. Karen Stills, who serves as Vice President of Student Services and Enrollment at El Centro College in Texas. Dr. Scott Thayer, who's Vice President of Student Services at San Bernardino Valley College in California. And Denise Wisenhunt, who's Vice President of Student Services at San Diego City College in California. Now, throughout the webinar, we're going to offer and share some of the thoughts and reflections that our subject matter experts shared with us in response to the questionnaire. We will also share many research-based strategies and practices that we have learned from well over a decade, uh, but nearly a decade of work in partnership with community colleges across the country. For those of you who are familiar with our work, you know that our focus on equity is about remediating disparities and disproportional impact in both experiences and in outcomes. And in doing so, we advocate for intentional strategies that close longstanding gaps in student success for students who have been underrepresented and underserved in education. And the way that we do so is by adopting a mindset of equity mindedness and institutional responsibility. According to Dr. Stella Ben-Simone, who created the concept of equity mindedness, what this means is that we must first and foremost recognize that inequity is not something that's just present within education. Inequity is a systemic issue in that almost every social institution that impacts our students and the lives of their loved ones are not serving them effectively, be it the employment system, the healthcare system, the criminal justice system, and so forth. Second, it also means that we must reframe outcome disparities and not see them as a student success issue, but see them as an issue related to institutional success as well. Third, we must not attribute outcome disparities exclusively to students or perceived deficits in their, in their identities, their circumstances, or their capabilities. And lastly, we must be critically, critically reflexive about who we are as educators and the role that we play in allowing inequity to exist and persist. And related to this, this last point, we also have to make sure that we're holding our colleagues accountable for being equity mindedness at being equity minded as well. Finally, as Luke and I shared in our last webinar, we must acknowledge that being racially conscious is at the core of equity mindedness. Now, this is not to say that other forms of oppression and discrimination are not important and should not be acknowledged. But what it does remind us is that race cannot be substituted or overlooked in our efforts to achieve educational equity. We also need to consider what does equity mindedness look like in the COVID-19 context. And in doing so, we offer this definition. Ensuring that all students, regardless of their identities or circumstances, can participate in virtual learning spaces in ways that will be value added to achieving their personal and academic goals. Special attention must be given to digital equity and that students must have access to the technology and technological knowledge that they need to seamlessly access and make meaningful contributions to the virtual learning space. And to further ground our discussion theoretically, I'd like to highlight some key constructs from the social ecological outcomes model that Luke and I developed several years ago. And the reason why we developed this model was to account for the factors that influence community college student success. At the far left of the model are constructs that we describe as inputs, which are the background defining and societal factors that shape students' identities as learners as they matriculate into community college. For example, their age, their primary language, and ability to name some. Now, with regard to societal factors, this construct accounts for things like social stereotypes about the intellectual capabilities of people of color, which influence the ways in which they're perceived by educators. 
Moving to the center of the model, the non-cognitive domain accounts for students' salient social identities and factors that shape their self-efficacy, the locus of control, their intrinsic interests, and perceptions of degree utility, to name a few. The academic domain includes students' interactions with faculty and their commitment to their programs of study. The environmental domain accounts for all of the stuff that is situated outside the physical campus environment that impacts students' capacities to fully engage. Issues related to basic needs, employment, family commitments, and access to technology are highlighted within this domain. The campus ethos domain is the one in which we have the most control over as educators, as this is where things like sense of belonging, creating welcoming conditions for students' engagement, the presence of validating agents, and caring relationships between students and educators are situated. And finally, the structural domain is about the training infrastructure, staffing patterns, and other campus resources that are invested towards achieving equity. And we argue that it's the dynamic interactions that occur between and within these domains that ultimately shape student success. As we introduce the practices, there are several things that are worth noting. First, all of the strategies that we'll present are informed by our work with well over 100 community colleges over the past nine years, as well as the published research on student equity and student success and the insights that are offered by our subject matter experts. Second, it's not enough to just apply the practices that we're discussing. They must be ap applied from an equity-minded perspective. Third, some practices will be more applicable in certain contexts, while you'll find that others can be more broadly applied. Fourth, all of the practices address key constructs of the SEO model, which I just spent a few minutes discussing. And finally, the goal of each strategy is to obtain an optimal balance between challenge and support, while also holding students to high expectations and conveying authentic care for them and their success. It's important that we have clarity in understanding the challenges that our students are facing in the current context. We know that prior to COVID-19, our disproportionately impacted students were already experiencing a multitude of pressures that impacted their health, their well being, and their success in college. Our subject matter experts provided additional insights on how COVID 19 has further complicated the experiences of these students. There were four issues that were salient in this regard. First is a lack of access to basic technological resources such as computers and reliable Wi-Fi and online learning aptitude. Second, students lack access to the supplies and resources they need to meet their basic needs. Third, students do not have access to the campus resources, staff, and information that they rely upon. Finally, students are struggling with balancing the demands of home, which include lost wages, having to homeschool their children, and caring for older family members while also making the transition to remote learning and keeping up with class assignments. Students are also experiencing isolation and a sudden loss of community with no longer being able to physically go to campus. Again, it is important to note that disproportionately impacted students often struggle with these same demands prior to COVID-19. However, the intensity of these issues has compounded as a result of the pandemic. In other words, the students who are, were already most vulnerable within the environmental domain have been hit the hardest by COVID-19. Each of our subject matter experts talked about the pressures of digital access for disproportionately impacted students. At its most fundamental level, this pressure entailed having access to the requisite tools that are necessary to fully participate in the virtual learning environment. This includes a having a, com a functional computer, not just a Chromebook, which has limited uh, capabilities, but a functional computer that allows them to fully participate. It also includes having access to reliable Wi-Fi. 
as we know, many of our students are already participating by way of their mobile phones, which are not necessarily adequate for viewing and navigating a learning management system. Technological aptitude, which refers to the digital skills and knowledge that are necessary to successfully navigate virtual learning spaces is another digital access challenge that our experts identified. With regard to this challenge, our experts noted that students may have the skills to use technology for the individual needs, such as social media and FaceTime, but these skills do not necessarily translate to a learning management system and other online systems that campuses are using to deliver a virtual learning experiences. In describing this issue, one subject matter expert noted, having adequate access to technology doesn't automatically translate into students knowing how to successfully navigate, the on, on, navigate online learning. Disproportionately impacted students may need to be primed for their excessive volume of reading that are and reading and writing that are traditionally associated with online courses. Services need to support students in understanding how to create a calendar, manage time, and prepare for online coursework. We also know that many of our disproportionately impacted students were relying on the resources that were being provided by their college to meet their basic needs, such as food, personal hygiene products, baby formula, and vouchers for public transportation. Also, many of these students were regularly accessing campus computer labs to do their coursework, campus health centers to meet their wellness needs, and were working part-time on campus for income. As we noted earlier, basic needs and securities have become exacerbated by COVID-19. Our subject matter experts also noted that students are experiencing difficulty accessing the resources, staff, and information that they need to both make the trip transition to remote learning, but also fully participate virtually. They recognize that there was excessive communication, usually by way of email, that lacked clarity and often had conflicting information which has made it difficult for students to identify who they should go to for needed support. In addition, even when they can identify who to go to, knowing when and how best to access staff was an added challenge. The subject matter experts also recognize that some campus resources and services are very difficult to move online and deliver remotely, an issue that we'll discuss further in a few minutes. And finally, as a result of these challenges, our subject matter experts noted that many colleagues have good intentions in offering support, but had little to offer with regard to tangible solutions. Consequently, some are defaulting to messages related to grit and determination, which are simply not helpful. For example, one of our subject matter experts noted, some faculty have provided office hours, sent letters home to students, or send repeated messages of, I'm here for you, without tangible information for access to resources. In one case, a faculty member is including language about grit and the need for grit to commit to this new learning space. Though I believe the faculty member is attempting to call upon student strengths, the delivery falls short of pull yourself up by your bootstraps approach. The experts also recognize that students are struggling with basic with balancing a new set of demands at home that are in direct conflict with their academic demands. Students must now not only care for school-aged children throughout the day, but also take on the responsibility of homeschooling. them. In addition, other students have been charged with caring for grandparents, parents, and other family members who may be ill or have health-related concerns. There's also the challenge of having a space at home that allows for concentration and deep engagement with academic work. Remember, many students have become accustomed to going to campus for classes and to study. Thus, there was a clear delineation between home and school. Of course, this is no longer feasible in today's context. And finally, some students are struggling with a sense of isolation at home and experiencing grief after having lost an academic community with which they have come to rely on for social interaction and support. As one of our subject matter experts noted, for many students, coming to campus is the escape from their real world concerns or issues. The subject matter experts also recognize that students, uh, the subject matter experts also recognize 
that um, many of our staff, staff and colleagues, it's not just our students who are experiencing and struggling with this transition, but staff are facing similar pressures. Among them are accessing technology, especially technology that requires them to access secure data systems. The need to be more engaged virtually. We've talked a lot about how the need, about the need for staff to be more intrusive, be more proactive, and be more available for students than they necessarily had to be in face-to-face -face environments. The intensity of the transition to online services, both in terms of needing to get trained and develop new skills and competencies, but also the need to do it within a matter of days in some cases, is another pressure that our experts identified. Not knowing exactly what students are facing with regard to barriers is another, and the pressure to do their work with a high degree of integrity and compliance with laws and policies so that campuses are not exposed legally to lawsuits is yet another pressure. Zoom fatigue, especially in homes that are not set up ergonomically, which leads to things like back pain and other physical ailments um, is a challenge. And then finally, there's the need to do all of which we have described while having to uh, homeschool kids and care for other family members, much in the same way that students have had to do. Again, it's not just students who are experiencing these, these pressures, but in many cases and in many respects, it's also staff and the people who are most responsible for serving students who are struggling with these same demands and concerns. All right, everyone, I'm excited to, to be here and be joining my brother in this work of Dr. Frank Harris. Um, so we've identified seven equity-minded practices based upon as Frank mentioned, our research, collaborations with colleagues who are also subject matter experts in this area, and based upon some of the, the normal practices that we talk about and thinking about how they apply in this online context. And so the seven equity-minded uh, practices for online student services that, that we've identified including, include be intrusive, be responsive, be race conscious, be informed, be community focused, be clear and validating, and be flexible and compassionate. And these areas are all interrelated, and we're going to see examples of not only what the practice looks like, but examples of what you can do um, in the field in response to COVID-19. But before we get there on the next slide, I'd like to just highlight a, um, a couple pieces uh, of information that are, that are really important. Um, first is that, um, in our survey work, we have collected data from student services colleagues across uh, many institutions in the country. And one of the things that we look at is what are the areas in need for further development? What are the areas that those who are on the ground interfacing with students every day say, we need more professional development in these areas? And based upon our survey results, we see that there are a few key areas that are certainly relevant and possibly even more relevant now than ever before. The first are empowerment techniques, um, where we are engaging in strategies and practices that empower students to gain greater sense of ownership in their own lives, to overcome problems that they, their families and their communities face. Relationship building, where we're building relationships with students that are typified by trust, mutual respect, authentic care, cultural competency, engaging students in, in a way that recognizes the roles of their culture, their racial backgrounds and their identities, engagement practices that allow us to further engage and be even more intrusive and responsive to student needs. And then of course, in a, a racialized world, recognizing the importance that racial microaggressions have and how that might influence student success. Uh, so now when we think about all the different practice areas, on the next slide, what you're going to see is basically our results from a national sample in terms of what are the areas that are in need of the greatest level of development. And this is based upon um, basically what we did is we surveyed those who are in student services across the country. We identified those that were in the top quarter producing community colleges in the country, and we used their their outputs as benchmark scores for the rest of the country to see what are the areas that we see greatest um, challenges. And it really isn't across the board, across all these strategies, such as relationship building or 
and understanding of institutional responsibility or high expectations, it's really that we can see that for different populations, there's different needs. In some ways, this is the kind of taking an equity concept and providing and uh, applying it to professional learning. But two things stand out to us when we look at this data. The first is that um, we see that there's greater issues um, for need of development in those who provide matriculation services. And as we uh, begin thinking about summer enrollment, as we begin thinking about enrollment for fall, this is going to be an area where we're gonna need to do a, a real intense work with those who are working in these areas around practices such as, such as intrusive support, microaggressions, understanding equity-mindedness. And then we also want to realize that those that are providing more, more of the academic services within student services, such as tutoring, supplemental instruction, those that might be working in other areas that might interface more directly uh, with um, instructional faculty, such as retention programs, like that's also a need, a greater area of need in terms of professional learning. So now with that context in mind, let's talk about these practices. So the first one is be intrusive. Be intrusive. And intrusive means that we are proactive in reaching out to students when they need it. So we can think of this in terms of two principles. We want to give them what they need even before they ask for it. And we want to give them what they need even before they might need they know it. No, they need it rather. So our goal is to do this not just simply because it's good practice, but because it also demonstrates care. By reaching out proactively to students, uh, it demonstrates care. On the next slide, you're gonna see some examples of what that actually looks like. So being intrusive involves being proactive and reaching out to students. So this can be done through your learning management system, using social media, um, on my staff, we're making weekly phone calls to students, checking in on them, seeing how they're doing, what do they need? Because the truth is we have to be proactive in how we're reaching out to students because in the, all the litany of emails that have been sent out by most institutions, a lot of things get lost in translation. It's, it can be unclear. We can have guidance that's now superseded by additional guidance that's been provided to us by county and state officials. And so as a result, it can create this, uh, this kind of sense that students don't totally know what's going on. So we have to be intrusive and reach out to them to give them what they need. And as doing so, we have to be prepared to have a catalog of resources that's available to them. Resources in terms of uh, food and housing insecurities, partnerships that we have available, uh, frequently asked questions, so that when we're on the phone or doing a live chat with students or whatever it might be, we can attend to the questions that they have um, in, in real time. Now, in order to be intrusive, you have to recognize that a simple modality of sending email or even doing a phone call is not enough. We have to use multiple modalities. We want to leverage texting, emailing, video conferencing, live chat, using your learning management system, all kinds of modes of modalities to make sure that we're reaching students with the information that they need. We want to check in on their status and provide them with information on with the resources that they need for the challenges that they that they have and by doing so it really requires us to have an all hands on deck approach if you're going to think about having every student on your campus be reached out to or a high concentration of students being reached out to that's going to involve people who are in different areas than would normally be doing student service work it might involve uh, training student workers to do the same thing which is a benefit not only for a continuity of employment uh, for students, but also for um, their ability to be able to um, respond to issues that other students might be facing. We wanna prioritize efforts with those who experience disproportionate impact or are on the margins. So we know that when there is a crisis that communities of color are more likely to be affected. We know that communities of color are more likely to experience disproportionate impact. And so our resources need to address the challenges that they are facing. So for example, it says students on the margin. Let's say that you're doing an analysis and you find a certain group of students that haven't logged into the learning management system. Or you have a certain group of students who haven't uh, been completing assignments. We wanna be proactive in reaching out to them 
And what we want to do is to get to them before they make the determination that they don't want to stay any lo longer. Because ultimately, um, what we don't want to do is have students either doing um, drops or late withdrawals or things that could adversely impact not only their academic performance, but possibly their aid, depending upon it, um, institutional deadlines. We also have to be proactive in our communication and information sharing with colleagues. So the information that goes to students should also be shared with faculty. It should also be shared with administrators so that people know what's going on and they know what messages are being shared and they know where the resources are. As part of that, you have to have a referral system. So for faculty who may not be used to dealing with um, extreme challenges like they're facing right now, being able to have a simple form that they complete when, they, when they're having a student who's experiencing a challenge and that's getting directed right into an intervention group that can reach out to that student and be proactive. So this goes above and beyond what would be a normal early alert system to a, a essentially a COVID response system. On the next slide, you'll see that we also contextualize why this matters. So when we're talking about our most minoritized students, we have to recognize that help seeking can be a real concern. They might be, if they're a student of color, they might be concerned that um, if they have, have to ask for help, that it's going to validate perceptions that they didn't really belong or that they weren't really cut out for the work. If they're men or men of color, help seeking can also be a challenge because they might have been socialized to perceive that having to ask for help is a sign of weakness or inferiority. So we don't want students to have to either approach us first or ask us first. Our job is to be there again, before they might even know that they need it. We also have to connect them with institutional agents who are validating. Now, if you were on our last webinar um, that we talked about how some of these practices apply in a teaching and learning um, context, one of the things that we talked about is this concept of connecting students to people, not services. So here's, here's the, the, the real truth. Everyone that works at our institution isn't as, com as committed to students, student equity and student success as maybe those who are on this webinar. So in reality, if you have a student who needs something in this environment, you can't say, well, call career services or go, go um, to this website and find this information or make sure you send an email to this person. We have to basically connect them to individuals that we know will follow up with them and will be there for them. So what we wanna do is essentially create an underground railroad, a list of equity-minded points of contact in each area, a list of equity-minded points of contact in each area. Relationships also serve as a necessary condition for fostering the use of services. So we wanna follow up and follow up is essential to student success. One person said on the next slide, one of our colleagues, because of these challenges, we have to think differently about how we serve. We are calling, texting, emailing, and video conferencing. We are providing information that we know that they will need as they navigate the situation. The additional list of resources, partnerships, facts, and support efforts are reflective of the information we believe underrepresented students need in order to complete their educational goals and get through this in general. We are engaging them through our learning management system, social media, et cetera. Next slide. The next strategy that we believe is important is to be responsive. Be responsive. So intrusive means that we're reaching out to them proactively. Responsive means that we're following up and giving them what they need when they've identified challenges that they are facing. So on the next slide, we talk about some strategies for, for doing this. So the first one is direct connections to resources. Students have real-time needs right now, whether it's computers, whether it's uh, Wi-Fi, whether it's dealing with issues of insecurities, they have real needs that they need and we have to be able to get them the, the resources that they need. Now, of course, this applies 
to students, but it also applies to staff as well. But we need to get the students what they need. So think about delivery of resources to their doors or mailing resources to them. So for example, some institutions are mailing out uh, gift cards for uh, food and housing and secure students. Or some campuses are do doing drive-through food banks or tech pickup, um, where they're offering even an option for transportation concerned students and those who are immunocompromised to delegate somebody to pick it up for them. Some institutions have ordered uh, upwards of five to 6,000 computers to put them in the hands of students who need it. So we have to be able to be responsive and can connect them with what they need. We need to also provide training on how to use the resources that are provided. Now, again, this is one that applies to both students and the staff. If we're expecting students to use, for example, Zoom, and they haven't used Zoom before, we probably need some sort of quick video on what they need to do or some basic practices of Zoom etiquette. Um, if they have never um, um, had, you know, had to use a Wi-Fi hotspot, there needs to be clear instructions on what to do. So we want to make sure that we're providing those resources to them and the explanation on what to do with them. Now, all of these issues of making sure we're providing direct connections are important in general, but they're even more important for students who experience disproportionate impact, for students who might live in rural communities that might have less access to stable Wi-Fi. So we have to recognize that these are things that we have to be thinking about. We also have to have quick response times um, to their comments and questions. If we're, we reach out to a student and we don't know the answer, we need to be able to follow up with the same, in the same day with the information that they need. If someone sends us an email or posts a comment, we need to be able to respond to it as fast as possible. Right now is the time for us to show that, that, show that we care through our responsivity. And as part of this, you may need to consider temporarily restructuring the organization. Um, for example, some institutions are moving to doing virtual one-stop shops or um, reassigning employees temporarily. Again, this can be good for continuity of employment, um, for, particularly for student workers. Structure it, it, it in a way that urgent issues are ele elevated quickly so that if there is a student who is experiencing a, an extreme concern, it's immediately elevated. It's brought to the person who can actually respond to it and then follow up is done with the students so they know what has taken place. In this new environment, because we're having to do this, information sharing is key. Uh, one of our subject matter experts said this, collaborate with instruction to create a virtual student, uh, go back Frank, uh, collaborate with instruction to create a virtual student success center. And we're gonna talk about what that means. But ultimately what we have to do is ensure that we're communicating care. So avoid uh, expressions of care without tangible solutions and support. For example, to say I'm here for you doesn't help. How about I'm here for you and here's what I can do, what do you need is different. And when you're talking with them, don't rush through, through responses. Um, you may, may need to probe them um, even further because again, if a student may be apprehensive about help seeking, making sure that you provide them with the time and attention that they need rather than, than rushing through things will also create a, a sense of momentary trust where they might be able to divulge other challenges that they're facing. Another strategy that we have to keep in mind is to check for clarity and next steps. So many of us have probably experienced this before. We have a student in, uh, you know, before COVID, we had a student who was in our office. We were working with them and there were some policy or procedure or form that they needed to fill out or, or something that they needed to do. And so we said, okay, so first you're gonna do this and then you're gonna do this and then you're gonna do this. And we gave them maybe a list of instructions of what they needed to do. And then at the end of that session, we asked the student that they get all the information that they needed from us and their response is, yup. But ultimately in reality, the student really didn't know what to do. They just didn't wanna say it. So. We need to double check for clarity and next steps so that they, we know that they know exactly what they need to do. Now, this has to be done carefully. You can't do it in a way where it suggests uh, that you don't believe that they have the capacity. So, you know, you wanna avoid, of course, unintentional micro, uh, microaggressions. What you really wanna do is just say, hey, 
as part, given everything that's going on, we're just double checking with all students. So um, I know that I just gave you these instructions. Can you repeat it back to me? I just want to make sure that you have everything you need uh, before, before we get off. And then have an action plan for following up with them afterwards to make sure that whatever it is that they needed, that they got, especially if it involves you having to refer them to somebody else. Even better if you can do a direct handoff. So on the next slide, one of our colleagues mentions what we need to do. Collaborate with instruction to create a virtual student services team per instructional school or division. For example, we have four divisions and we have assembled a team inclusive of a representative for all student services areas that are specifically assigned to a division. The divisions are organized by pathway. That, this way, deans and coordinators can distribute a contact list for student services that are available to serve as a liaison for the faculty associated with, with their area. Now, again, you can structure it in any way you want, but ultimately, uh, the systems and policies and structures that we had in place may not be working as well in this time as they would have been pre-COVID. So we need to be creative in how we're reaching out to our students. On the next slide, you'll see an additional um, word of advice. Advocate for technology resources to be made available. For example, in our district, student laptop distribution was centralized to one of the sister colleges because from a health and safety perspective, we need to mitigate exposure. However, our team advocated um, that our students may not have access to transportation to get that part to that part of the county. So we included a proxy person to pick up for them and later pushed for the ITS team to hold a distribution site on our campus for students to get access to laptops and calculators. Next slide. Of course, in all the work that we do, we also have to be race conscious. Now, there's a lot of talk now of what might be a, a pre-existing condition or in a, an area of greater exposure when it comes to COVID. And um, a great historian, Claiborne Carson, said that poverty should be considered a pre-existing condition. I think we would contend that race should be considered a pre-existing condition because in reality, we know that there are structures that are set up that prevent many of our most minoritized students from getting what they need. So as part of being race conscious, we believe on the next slide that you first have to recognize the effects of systemic oppression. So one thing that's important to know is that bias is more prevalent now than it has ever been before. Um, in our work, we often talk about the conditions that lead to implicit bias. They include people having incomplete information. They include having your time constrained. They include having stressful conditions and being in heightened emotional states. All of those conditions are more prevalent now than ever before. And so we believe that bias is at an all time high. So it's important that we are being cognizant of systemic oppression and bias in this time as student service services professionals, but also holding our colleagues um, across the institution accountable. Part of what we have to do is to realize uh, that systemic oppression is multiplied in terms of, in times of crisis because of the intersection um, with, other, with access to uh, systems such as healthcare. We wanna be intentional about all efforts in serving our DI students. Let's just be real. Our institutions are primarily set up to serve white students. So if you're not being intentional about student, serving students of color, then you're being intentional about not serving them. Virtual programming that can engage people in issues of race because that's the experience that they live is also important during this time. We also believe that you have to be overhauling websites right now and resources to be as culturally relevant as possible. This is important because the primary interface that, that students are having with our campuses is, our, is virtual. So what they see on the web. So if the website and all the pictures that you have are um, of students who aren't reflective of the diversity of your student population, then that's a problem. If you have websites that are fully text-based with no images to break it up, that's a problem. 
we want to be culturally relevant now, and that requires us to have intentionality. We also want to ensure that staff are trained on culturally relevant practices. And that involves us engaging in webinars such as this or in other um, opportunities to ensure people know what that actually means. We also want to cross train with faculty to ensure cultural relevance in, inst in instruction. Student services oftentimes do does much better in this area. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to work with our colleagues to make sure that they know how to engage students in, an, in a manner that is welcoming, that is affirming, that is not microaggressive. So ultimately, part of what we have to do, our responsibility is to hold our colleagues accountable. Next slide. So this is what one of the co our colleagues said that we think is really important to share with you about the role that uh, systemic oppression has and why we have to be race conscious right now. This individual said, the most significant barriers include those connected to the intersection of race and socioeconomic challenges, as well as health disparities, because African Americans and Latinx communities have historically been and are currently minoritized through laws and practices in various systems such as education, law, social services, housing, hiring practices in every sector, etc. When something unprecedented like this occurs or happens, it is, the, it is the people in these communities who are going to be most severely impacted. When our physical campuses close uh, to reduce risk of exposure to COVID-19, the barriers of providing these resources are very challenging to address. I think many people are learning a lot from this experience. The digital divide is real. Racial inequities are pervasive and race is linked to socioeconomic disparities as well as health disparities. These are the results of societal practices. Community colleges in particular are trying to address that. Next slide. Another colleague said, and this is really thinking about how we can make sure that we're uh, engaging in practices that are culturally relevant, particularly with our, our web presence. In some respects, it is the same as face-to-face -face in that using culturally appropriate language and welcoming nonverbal communication. Backgrounds, photographs, images online can all, websites, links, messages, become the only connection between the student and the college and intentional efforts need to be made in imaging and what is seen by the students. Creating culturally relevant spaces such as ensuring that Puente and emoji spaces have online presence, presences is important so that the isolation that comes from learning alone can be ameliorated. Now, for those of you who are um, outside of the state, Puente and Moja are um, retention programs for Latinx and African-American students. Next slide. We also want to be informed. We have to have information that's informing the work that we're doing. Now is not the time for anecdote. Now is not the time for assumptions. On the next slide, we talk about some things that we have to think about when doing this. First, we want to make sure that we are making informed decisions not just based upon assumption or what sounds good. We have to be intentionally reaching out to stu students, uh, surveying them, interviewing them, calling them, and make sure that we, um, if, there, if you are a person who is a, an executive uh, administrator in student affairs, that you're connecting with staff who are on the ground so that you're getting the best possible information today. You also want to collate data from intrusive reach outs and inquiries and make sure that that's being shared across the institution so people know what students are experiencing. Now, let me say this. It's n this is not a one-time survey situation. This is ongoing reach outs for students, but some of the normal things that we would suggest in terms of comprehensiveness of surveys has to be done a little bit differently. The surveys need to be short. They need to have pre-populated categories that students can fill out, and there needs to be immediate reach out. And whatever we're doing, we have to make sure that we are reaching out to them and gathering information to inform our decision making as part of a regular practice. Here are some example questions that we've heard people have been using. For what immediate needs, no, go, uh, go back, Frank. Um, what immediate needs or concerns are you facing? What resources, services, or programs would you like to see at this time? What is the best way for us to communicate with you? How concerned are you about the grades this semester in comparison to a normal semester? What has been the biggest challenge you have faced 
in your classes since you switched to virtual instruction? Is there a particular class that you do not think is going well since you switched? Why? The learning also about issues of mental health and well being, access to technology, and how the difficulties in courses have changed. On the next slide is just an example of some of these questions and ones that we think are part of what would be a preliminary reach out if this hasn't been done. And these reach outs if you, uh, should be, again, not just a single time, but multiple reach outs to make sure that students are getting what they need. The other part that's important here is that we, we have to remember that we have other data sources that we can use to inform decision making. We should be collating data from our learning management systems, our customer relationship management systems, your enterprise performance management systems, and your human resource management systems to help inform what's taking place on the ground. And the last slide that I have before I turn it back to my colleague um, just talks about some, some comments from um, subject matter experts in terms of what they're thinking on this. So data collection analysis and implementation of services. This is such an early stage of learning for us. We need to collect and analyze data and create space for students to breathe life into what the data is telling us so that we are meeting real needs in real ways. The other, and another one said, the other thing is each student affairs professional should remember that your computer information system has so much data for you to use for personal information. You can query about students who have not logged yet into Canvas or your learning management system. You can disaggregate that by race and ethnicity so you know which students are experiencing difficulties and then use that information to create solutions. Next slide. Thank you, Luke. Um, our next strategy is to be community focused. And what this entails is that we are intentional in creating virtual communities and spaces that enable students to engage in dialogue about their lives and what's transpired in the wake of COVID-19. And this is important to do because it's here where students can kind of make sense of the transitions that they've occurred. They can talk about the ways in which families and loved ones have been impacted. And Maybe more importantly, they can share strategies and resources that they have found helpful in maintaining a sense of normalcy and continuity. Um, campuses also might want to consider using external contractors to continue to meet some of the students' essential needs. So this might mean contracting for services like counseling and healthcare via telephone. Um, another example that we've seen is that some colleges uh, are working with local food service providers to deliver meals to students who might be experiencing food insecurity. Um, if you're going to be providing how-to videos, which Luke referenced earlier about the importance of making sure that students have the knowledge and the capacity to utilize uh, online services, you have to make sure that the videos are brief. So I would say no more than five minutes. Um, and it should be a video that students can access pretty easily on their phones. And the videos, again, should focus on how students can access campus resources remotely. It can focus on skills for planning and staying organized. It can um, you know, focus on using tools like Google, Google Drive, um, setting up calendar appointments, um, accessing learning management systems, and so forth. So thinking about the, the tools and resources that students are going to have to access regularly. Now, it's important to be mindful that for some of these uh, systems, students are going to have to access them using campus login credentials. And so you also have to make sure that whatever information you provide to students, that there's also some direction on how they can, they can get their, their login credentials uh, if they need them. We also have to be mindful and recognize this, is that many of our underrepresented students are coming uh, from relying heavily on their identity-based learning communities. So learning communities such as Puente and Yemoja, which Luke referenced a few minutes ago, but also clubs and organizations. Uh, and so it's very important that we continue to somehow offer space for these communities to still be sustained virtually. Um, and when you do this, it's important to make sure that these spaces are inclusive and that they don't require students to compartmentalize their roles as parents, um, partners, and caregivers. And then finally, with regard to this last point around being community focused, it's important to make sure that students have an opportunity to provide feedback on how the campus is supporting them, 
to talk about the needs that they have that, that are perhaps not being adequately met. Um, and this can be done in a number of different ways. So we can use email, um, we can use text messaging, phone calls, social media. Um, whatever you do, it's important to be clear about what type of response a student can expect and to make sure that there's somebody who's monitoring these portals on an ongoing basis. With regard to being community focused, uh, one of the subject matter experts had this to say, key programming efforts for underrepresented students as essential activities. For example, men of color groups, formerly incarcerated students, foster youth, first generation, et cetera. We have the power to name and prioritize these community spaces as essential operations for students, provide virtual spaces for the inclusion of family, especially small children, so that students can have support and keep community during this time. Our next strategy is to be clear and validated. And it's important that we are both clear and validating with regard to, um, it, it's important that we, we exercise both clarity and validation in our communication with students during this time. And in order to do this, there are several practices that we have to employ. First, we have to make sure that communication occurs in a timely manner. If we reflect and think about some of the remarks that Luke shared earlier about being intrusive, ideally we're sharing information with students before they actually need it. Um, but we also need to make sure that this information is simple, it's easy to understand. So that means that long, exhaustive email messages with a bunch of links and directions to go to, that those are probably not very helpful at this time. And as a matter of fact, they probably do more harm than good in that they create stress, anxiety, and information overload. Again, if you're using videos, which we talked about um, in our discussion about the last strategy, you know, making sure that the videos are captioned, making sure that they're translated, and it doesn't require a lot of bandwidth to watch. As, you know, all of us have probably had moments where we're recognizing that bandwidth because all of our lives in many ways and all of the essential things that we do has been moved uh, virtually, bandwidth is a, is a scarce resource. So having videos and having tools that don't require a lot of it is gonna be really important right now. Communications also need to be streamlined and come from a select few of individuals. So you shouldn't have everybody sending out a bunch of information to students, right? But Whatever you do, make sure that communications that students receive, that they're also shared with faculty and staff to make sure that there's consistency and guidance as well as messaging. And above all, communications, every communication should hit three points. First is that the campus is there to support the students during this difficult time. Second, it should also be clear in communicating what information and resources students can expect and how they can access those resources, right? And then lastly, it's important to end every communication with a validating message, that they can do it, that they can be successful, and that above all, the campus is there to support them and make sure that they are successful. And we've seen quite a few campuses that have made good use of social media in order to do this. So we see messages around, you know, before you drop a class, make sure you reach out to a staff member, um, and all sorts of creative things that campuses have done in order to, to be validating in this context. Two of our subject matter experts talked about uh, strategies as well. The first is I designed three student services communications to students, which I sent to faculty and staff as well, letting them know that this is what students will be receiving. First, technological resources. Second, accessing student services during campus closure. And third, accessing tutoring during campus closure. Another colleague had this to share. Students need positive affirmation early and often. Text messaging is an important communication method because while all students may not have a laptop, most do have phones. Students already demonstrated that they don't read emails, but they do check texts. So posting meaningful messages via social media outlets is also important. Finally, we created a video from diverse faculty and staff welcoming students to online learning 
and telling them that, that we are here to help them along the way. And our final strategy is to be flexible and compassionate. In sharing this strategy, I want to remind you about the big four pressures that students are experiencing right now during COVID-19. Digital access, basic needs and securities, access to campus resources, staff and information, and balancing the conflicting demands of home and school. So what this means is that students are not waking up thinking about their classes, academic deadlines, or other school related concerns. It's not the first thing that's on their mind when they begin their days. And in fact, when it comes to school, most of them are probably asking themselves if now is the best time for them to be enrolled. So given this, we must approach this issue from an institutional responsibility perspective and ask ourselves, does this policy procedure or deadline need to be rigidly enforced at this time? And second, if so, is it likely to have a disproportionate impact on our most vulnerable students? If the answer is no to the first question, or yes to the second question, then the policy needs to be relaxed or reconsidered. Also, if possible, give students refunds for things like parking and other campus services that they paid for and did not utilize. And in doing so, do not make them have to jump through a bunch of hoops to do so. So as a matter of fact, it's best if these refunds are given automatically without students having to have to actually make a request. And we also need to rethink the hours during which some of our core support services are offered. Recognizing that the traditional nine to five schedule is probably not the best way to capture most students who need support. And in fact, let's be honest, the schedule hasn't really been great for community college students for a long time. Um, but this is especially true in the current context. And here's what a couple of the subject matter experts had to say with regard to handling refunds as well as scheduling core services first. We're refunding parking permit funds to students, as well as Metro passes. We've also moved up our financial aid second spring distribution by one month. So students will have financial resources needed to navigate this difficult time. Second, with regard to scheduling. Schedule staff to provide support coverage for hours beyond a traditional nine to five workday. Support students who may have responsibilities or distractions during the day. For example, care for children or elders or homeschool. With that, um, before we transition into the, the question and answer period, I do want to share an opportunity that our, our colleague, uh, Dr. Keith Curry, who's the CEO at Compton College, who uh, we affectionately refer to as the People's President, has um, organized a virtual town hall, town hall meeting. Um, and it's a conversation for policymakers in California about African-American student success. Um, it's going to be held on April 22nd. So we would definitely encourage you to participate in this town hall. Um, it is uh, Thank you again for your participation and support. And with that, uh, we're going to take a few. Hey, Frank, um, yep. you could go yep. back to that previous slide you, you cut out. And, and I don't think people got to hear about the town hall. If you could just repeat that information. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, virtual town hall for um, policymakers and colleagues in California that's going to be focused on African-American student success. Um, it's going to be offered on April 22nd at 3 p.m. Pacific time. There is a link to register, which you can uh, take a picture of here. And uh, it's again, it has a, a focus on what's happening here in California, but there may be colleagues in other states who find it um, insightful and can value added as well. And with that, we're going to transition to the question and answer period. Just as a reminder, you have two options. You can post your questions on Twitter uh, using the hashtag Equity Online. Um, we also have the Q&A option here in Zoom. And again, just as a reminder, there are about almost 5,000 people that are registered for this webinar. So we're not going to be able to get to every question, but we'll get to and through as many as we can. So I'm pulling up um, the first question, um, and 
Well, it, well, I'll just address a question that's been coming through a lot about the slides. So the, we are going to make the recording of this presentation available um, within um, a day. And then we will make sure that that is sent out to you. And the recording, of course, includes all the slides that we went through, but um, we don't anticipate sharing the slides separately from that. But since that has been asked so many times, we will make sure that that recording uh, has a transcript so that it's um, accessible uh, for those uh, who might need, uh, need that. And, um, and then there was a question about whether or not we would be offering this, this webinar again. We we'll probably won't because we're going to be making the, the recording available. However, if you have a closed in the group that you would like us to present to, um, you know, just make sure you can feel free to reach out to us and we can, we can discuss that. Um, the, one of the attendees said this, and I think it's, it's an important point to point out. They said the webinar speaks about being race conscious as, as a strategy, uh, as, an equity, um, as a strategy towards equity during COVID. Will you speak to anti-Asian racism and xenophobia and how institutions can address this? So um, I think it, one of the ways to address this is to be open and transparent that, they, that it's occurring. Um, so part of it needs to be recognizing that that's not just something that's occurring somewhere else, but it's occurring in our communities too. So I believe in messaging from executive leadership talking about these as issues and real concerns. I believe in um, if you have, say, um, an, an Asian faculty and staff association or some other uh, or a cultural um, organization, or um, they can be able to host a virtual conversation talking about the effects of these kinds of of uh, negative messages that we're seeing. We have to recognize that students are, are seeing these messages and it affects them, and so are our faculty and staff. So it's necessary for us to think about how can we engage in this conversation in a virtual space in a way that brings in uh, uh, individuals from both communities. Frank? Yeah, thank you. Um, next question. Can you provide examples regarding policies that some colleges have changed in regard to attendance, grading, dropping courses, et cetera? Would be helpful to hear more about what others have already done to be flexible and compassionate. So we've seen um, a lot of different strategies in, in, in response to this question. So harmless grading is the one that we probably see most often where um, colleges are moving to a pass no pass option for um, courses that are traditionally only available for letter grades. And we know at least here in our state of California, there's been lots of coordination between the three public systems of higher education. So um, our community colleges, the California State University system, as well as the University of California system around what exactly that means, um, making sure that students are not harmed by this, as well as um, putting annotations on transcripts saying, you know, student took this course pass no pass because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic and so forth. Um, we've also seen some colleges uh, suspend probation and disqualification policies. So if a student is on academic probation and they needed to meet a certain threshold with regard to grade point average by the end of the semester or face academic disqualification, colleges are suspending that. Um, that policy, as well as suspending the policy for students who are subject to academic disqualification at the end of this semester. And then also um, a lot of different things around uh, reducing and, and dropping the, the course drop deadlines. So we would say this, if that's a strategy you want to employ, then we recognize that that's an important thing to do, but also think about what are some things you can do before students make the decision to actually drop, um, before they make the decision to drop a course or to actually withdraw from the entire semester. Okay, um, the next question uh, was kind of a, a, about some of the nomenclature that we used um, with DI. DI refers to students who experience disproportionate impact, so those who have outcomes that are, are lower than that of their peers. Um, and oftentimes this refers to our most minoritized uh, student populations. And then another question was, how can we support um, equity around internet access? Uh, many uh, resources currently shared our 60-day limited trials that would require a family to sign on to a company contract. 
I'm glad that you brought this up because it was a point that I had down that I forgot to get to. Now, there are um, some institutions have the capacity to be able to offer um, Wi-Fi um, hotspots. If you can do that for your students, um, I think that's a, an opportunity. Some institutions have explored whether or not it would create um, problems for students to be able to um, drive onto campus to use the um, to use basically the parking lot um, so that they would have access to the campus internet. That's probably not a good idea now as, as it would have been uh, maybe a couple weeks ago. Um, but what we do want to do is make sure that now with all these companies that are 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 in in the spirit of 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 good intentions and probably also the spirit of business, uh, making available you know uh, Wi-Fi for a 60-day trial period. We want to make sure that we are working with those organizations so that whatever they are offering that's going to our students is um, a contract or something that we vetted so that our students aren't going to be um, basically signed up and then um, further targeted um, for uh, communication, further targeted for sales, or stuck into a contract. And so I, I think that the that is not a strategy that we um, that we want to engage lightly. So there has to be a, a discussion here. Now, this brings us to something that we didn't talk about a lot today, but that's the concept of risk. Risk is now higher um, than ever before on so many levels. And there's, of course, multiple different types of risk, right? Um, there's uh, compliance risk, there's equity risks, uh, there's health and safety risks, there's reputational risks for our institutions. There, there are all these different types of risks that are, that are taking place. And so what we wanna do is make sure that we're engaging in calculated risks and not just um, make just doing something because it sounds good or it feels good. Because ultimately we have to recognize that it can have a negative long-term effect on our, on our organizations. And so these need to be part of the conversations um, in terms of, of, of how we're reaching students because what we've seen is a relaxation of policies, procedures, deadlines, timelines, and bureaucracy, which has allowed us to be more responsive to the students, but that also comes on it with the backside of it, which is that it can create a greater likelihood that unintended consequences can occur. And oftentimes what we see is that unintended consequences usually have even greater impact on our most minoritized students. All right, next question. Sort of, I, I think somewhat related to the response that Luke just shared. Can you speak to strategies for returning to campus? Once we get back to business as normal, suggestions on how to be mindful of pre-existing and new challenges. And I really, I really like this question because it's probably not something that most of us are thinking about right now, but it is something that we need to be mindful of. Just like we had a transition and we had to be intentional and mindful about the transition from you know, our traditional operations to remote operations, which entailed um, you know, communicating with clarity, being validating, um, being intentional, being intrusive. We have to apply some of those same principles as we help students um, and our staff, it's not just students, make the transition back to campus as well. And so it might mean that, you know, it, let's say, for example, um, you know, we're able to, to be back to somewhat normal operations in the fall, where we might need to think about what are our, what are our grading policies need to be? Do we need to, you know, again, have a little bit more flexibility around student registrations, um, you know, withdraw and drop, add and withdraw deadlines, all of these things. So, you know, I know most of us, again, we're just trying to, you know, somehow make it through this spring term and make sure that students are taken care of and have what they need to successfully complete this term and to transition successfully to the summer. Um, at a certain point, we need to think about what are the things that we need to do? How do some of these same practices that we're, that we're talking about today, how are they going to apply as we make the transition back to campus? And maybe that's something Luke and I could, um, could take up as another webinar topic um, that, that folks may find helpful sometime in, in, in late summer, perhaps, depending on what, um, you know, what the situation is at that time. Well, with, with that, um, 
uh, I think that we've addressed um, a, a good number of questions and we can continue to engage people through social media. Um, at this point, we just want to thank you for your time and for your engagement in what we believe is a critically important topic. And to remember that equity and equity mindedness is not simply to be employed in, in good times, but even more so in times of crisis. And so we wish you all um, a good rest of your day. Um, we hope that you will be safe. We hope that you will be intrusive and we look forward to connecting with you um, on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.